Hi everyone, I'm Joe and welcome to What's That Piece Do, a video series where are we exploring history through tabletop games. So this is my tutorial and brief history lesson on Red Flag Over Paris, as designed by Fred Serval and released on GMT Games. It's the rise and fall of the Paris Commune. So the year is 1871 and France is in turmoil. The aggressions from their Prussian neighbors had caused the Second Empire to collapse and Paris in particular was in shambles. Royalists in the bourgeoisie are attempting to assemble a government which has moved the country's geographic center of power from the city and mostly serves the French elites, all while troops continue to occupy the streets of Paris. The working class Parisians are being cast aside, including those that were enlisted as troops to defend the nation against the Prussians in the first place. So, inspired by the philosophies of communism and Marxism, the citizens of the city begin to band together to form self-rule in opposition to the ruling elites. This new Paris Commune is able to seize weapons and key buildings in the capital, leaving the Versailles government with no choice but to react. So Red Flag Over Paris is a two-player game where one player takes the side of the Versailles government and the other player the side of the Commune. Each side will be striving for their own version of victory, Versailles trying to score military points uh, more so than the Commune scores political points and vice versa. It's a battle for the streets as well as the hearts and minds of Paris and beyond. So I'll be going over the rules as quickly and efficiently as I can to get you into the game and help you understand the flow of play. I'll also cover a bit more history after the rules teach. This video is not meant to replace the rule book in any way, all right? So you're gonna wanna keep this handy. There's a few little nuances and just things you're gonna wanna reference uh, throughout the game. There's also this great playbook with lots of handy information as well. You're gonna wanna take a look at, as well as these player aids. They're gonna help you throughout the game as you get used to the course of play. But before we start, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons as I plan on doing more videos in this format. And for now, I don't have anything specific to promote myself, so I would like to promote the Game Designers channel on YouTube. Fred runs Homo Ludin, which has lots of excellent videos, many interviews and conversations with other designers, as well as some playthroughs that help you experience other games in this realm. But for now, let's hit the table, let's hit the board, let's go, or as they say in France, Allons-y. The main map of the board depicts the political realm on the left, which includes these institutional and public opinion spaces, and the right is the military realm, with Paris and fort spaces. Players will be placing and removing cubes from these spaces to ultimately gain control of all the spaces in these groups of three, to score the points. Control is defined as at least one more cube than your opponents in that space. You'll notice these lines between the spaces that depict adjacency. This indicates where you can make particular actions, whether or not you have control over one space that can affect the next space. Notice in the political spaces, there are these arrows going into the space called National Assembly. That means other spaces are adjacent to that space, but it's not adjacent to the others. This is the score track, depicting the points for the Versailles player on the left and the Commune player on the right. The pawns themselves represent political and military points that they move in the direction of a player that's scoring the points at the end of the action phase. Versailles is going to be focused on military points for the end game scoring and commune for political points. Whomever has the most of their specific goal points will win the game. So players will be trying to up their score in the track that they're focused on while also trying to reduce the other player's score for their track. More on scoring shortly and this will make more sense as we continue. The crisis tracks are where each of the player's cubes are stored. When pulling cubes from the crisis track, any bonus cubes above go into the player's respective cube pool. And if there are any cubes in these pools, the cubes come from there to be placed on the board first before the track. More on cube pools in a minute. The first player to take a cube from their final crisis spot will receive their bonus cubes on top but lose one political point. The second player to breach their space won't lose a point but they won't get access to the bonus cubes either. If this space is breached in the first or second round of card play by both players, then the next round will skip directly to the final crisis round. The momentum track provides bonuses to players as each step is achieved, along with a bonus point on the final stage. As a Versailles player increases their momentum, they get more cubes. As a commune player does so, that means that their cube pool opens up. Versailles player already has a cube pool no matter what the momentum track is and it can hold unlimited cubes that come from the crisis track or are removed from the board. 
The common player's cue pool is strictly determined by their momentum level. They don't have any cue pool to start. So that increases to two at the first step, another one for a total of three at the second step, and another one for a total of four if they're at the third and final step. You'll notice these symbols at the second and third step of each momentum track, showing that the opponent will get to place a cube if that step is reached. So commune player increasing theirs to two means Versailles player gets to place a cube in any institutional space, and Versailles player increasing to two means the commune player can place in any public opinion space. Placement is optional, so if the player receiving the award doesn't have enough cubes or has other plans for their cubes or already has enough in those spaces, they don't need to take that bonus. The same bonus applies at the third step of each momentum track, and it will happen each time they hit those steps, as sometimes the momentum track can be reduced and then raised back up again. When the Versailles player is at their third step, they get an added bonus of adjacency to these spaces in the military side of the board, which can open up options for them when it comes to placing their cubes or removing commune cubes or adding military strength. Each player scores their respective points if their momentum is at the third space of the track at the end of the game. Only wait until the end of the game to score that, as you'll see momentum may move up or down. In the strategy deck, there are three types of cards. Commute event, Versailles event, and neutral event cards. Each specific faction's event can only be used by that faction in the card play or action phase, and players may be able to use the event on a card played by their opponent if it matches their faction, more on that shortly. And neutral events can only be played by whoever is playing them from their hand, and some can only be used if the player has initiative, more on that shortly as well. When played from your hand, they can be used for the event, or for the 1, 2, or 3 operation points to add or remove cubes on the board spaces. There are two unique strategy cards that don't get shuffled into the deck, but remain face up by the board, one for the commune player and one for the Versailles. You may choose to play this card by discarding one in your hand in the first three rounds, but if you do so, only the four operations points will be used, or if they're held into the final round, aka Final Crisis, they will be used for their events, which are pretty powerful. Objectives cards are selected by each player at the beginning of each of the three rounds, but not the final crisis round. These remain hidden. Only a player holding them knows what the objectives are. If the player holding them controls the space noted on the card at the end of the round of play, they'll get to score a point for political or military space that it belongs to, and be able to take the extra actions on the card. With that in mind, let's get into a round of play, aka the action phase. At the start of each of the three opening rounds, players will each be dealt four cards from the strategy deck, plus two objective cards. You only get to play three of those strategy cards, and one can be used and saved for the final crisis, if you so choose. You'll select one of the objective cards, placing it face down in the allotted space, and discard the other from the game, knowing it won't be seen again. You're allowed to look at your objective card again throughout the round as a reminder, but players can't see their opponent's secret objective card. First player is determined by the initiative card. At the beginning of the game, it starts commune side up. The player with initiative chooses who gets to go first, but if they give up the first played card to the opponent, they have to flip the initiative card. It may determine whether they can even trigger neutral events, and will allow them to choose who gets to go first in the pivotal space in the objective scoring rounds later. Now you're ready to play, so let's see what actions you can take with those strategy cards. One option is to increase your momentum track. In order to do that, you simply discard a card from your hand, removing it from the game. It's important to take it completely out of play, not to discard pile for reasons that will be clear shortly. Move your pawn up one space on the momentum track, receiving the bonus for you, extra cubes or space in your cube pool, and the other player taking the place the cube reward if it's applicable. Next option is to use the operations points to place your cubes in either political or military spaces. If you're using more than one point, note that all place and remove actions must take place on the same side of the board. Simply place a cube first from your cube pool before taking it from the crisis track and place in a space that you have presence or adjacent to a space where you have control. As a reminder, control is where you have more cubes than your opponent. So as an example, a commune isn't present here, but has adjacent control, so they can place. They may not place here, as they are neither present, nor do they have any control in an adjacent space. 
Remember, National Assembly isn't adjacent. Commune is always present in social movements, so no matter what, they'll be able to take an action there. Likewise, Versailles has presence in Royalists and Commune in Pierre Lachaise. Versailles has this non-space HQ, which they control, so they can always take the actions in the adjacent spaces. And as mentioned, they will have control of the Prussian-occupied territory when their momentum track is at the highest level. Another thing to note, presence and control are assessed at the beginning of all removals and then again at the beginning of all placement. For example, Commune has control in the press, but no control in Republicans and no presence whatsoever in National Assembly. So they won't be able to do anything in National Assembly this turn. Best they can do is set up for their next turn. Once you've used the operation points and completed your operations, place that card in the discard pile. Instead of adding their own cubes, the player may use operations points to remove their opponent's cube. Removal in political spaces have the same similar conditions as a place option. If you have presence in that space or control from an adjacent space, you can simply remove. One operations point per cube removed. Removed cubes go to the player's cube pool only, which again is unlimited for Versailles, but limited to the number of spaces on the momentum track for the commune. If there's no space in the commune pool, that cube is removed from the game. But don't remove it too far, as you'll see you might get lucky and get those cubes back. For military, remove is a bit different. As you can imagine, military actions take some military strength. Presence or adjacency alone isn't enough, you need to rack up military strength to match or beat the operations points on the hidden card on the top of the strategy deck. You accumulate military strength with presence in the target space for one, control of the target space for one more, control of each adjacent space, and you can use a maximum of one of your operations points from the card that you're playing. If your military strength is 3, the removal automatically succeeds. Otherwise, pull the top card of the strategy deck to see if you match or beat those points. The flipped card is then removed from the game, not placed in the discard pile. If there's a fortification or barricade in space, it will take 2 operations points to perform the remove action, no matter what. Fortifications and barricades can only be removed after all of that faction's cubes have been removed. By the way, those fortifications and barricades, they're only added to the board via some of the triggered events and mostly from the objective cards for military spaces. More on those in a minute. If you have multiple operations points, you can do a combination of remove and place. As long as all those operations are just in the political or just in the military spaces. But you must take any and all remove operations before placing. So in this example, you could place to have control to then remove. There's no daisy chaining. Always be sure to check control and presence as required for that operation. And finally, cards can be used for their event text. The player may use their faction's event or neutral event if it's in their hand. Follow the text exactly as per the instructions as some have events that will allow you to break the normal rules of play. For example, if it says place, or replace, or remove in a space where you don't have presence or adjacent control, you can do it anyway. If the card says use operational points, well, then you'll need to follow specific rules around placing and removal of cubes, including presence, control, and always removing before placing. Events may allow you to increase or decrease your momentum or your opponent's momentum. Again, this is why we don't score those extra points until the end of the game. Note that each time momentum goes up to the third or second space, the other player gets the bonus placement. Commune's pool can then potentially shrink and be decreased by momentum, but Versailles doesn't need to place their cubes back in the track. Another rule breaker that comes from the events, sometimes a commune card allows the player to place those cubes that were removed from the game, i.e. those that got removed when there was no room in their cube pool. These holy cubes have been resurrected to rebel another day. Not only can players trigger events as played from their hand, they may also trigger the event that's on top of the discard pile if it belongs to their faction. To do so, the player must discard a card of equal or higher point value to that card to take advantage of the event. That discarded card is then placed on top of the discard pile once you're done reading and executing the event that you're using. 
Once each player has played three cards, take the remaining card in your hand. You should only have one, even if you played your Final Crisis card, since you had to discard a card in your hand to use it, and set them face down near your side of the board. You'll potentially get to use these in the Final Crisis round of play. Remember, in Final Crisis, you'll only be using them for the event, not the operations points. Next, after everyone's played all three cards, we'll move on to scoring, where any player that controls all three spaces in one of the crisis dimensions gets to score their political or military point for controlling those spaces. But before that, players may be able to shift cubes around depending upon whether they control the pivotal spaces. Pivotal spaces are star-shaped spaces. One of the three in each crisis dimension is called a pivotal space. If a player controls that space at the end of the round, they can do one of three actions. They can spread their influence by moving any two of their cubes in that crisis dimension to another space within that dimension. They can turn coat. They can exchange one of their opponent's cubes for one of their own. Or they may de-escalate, which includes removing two of their own cubes or one of each of theirs and their opponent's cube. Basically, this will allow players to gain control of a crisis dimension that they might not already have. If there's no benefit from any of those actions, i.e. the player executing the action won't gain any control of the spaces they need, they don't need to take the actions. Just revel in the control of the space. Once the pivotal space actions are taken, players will then move on to the dimension scoring. Each player will score points for controlling all three spaces in a crisis dimension. Next, players will reveal and score their objective cards, but in the order determined by the initiative player. If the player holding that card controls that space, they'll score points for the space that the objectives are in, military or political, and be allowed to take the actions on the card. For military spaces, this is one of the main ways that fortifications and barricades enter the game. Players will get to set achieved objective cards aside because they may be needed for the tiebreaker. It's worth noting that there's only one objective card for each space on the board, so there's zero chance of either player vying for control of the same objective space in any given round in any game. Once objectives are determined, you're ready for the next round. Advance the turn marker and now determine who has initiative. Initiative is calculated by which player has the highest number when you take their political points and subtract their player momentum. So in this example, Commune player has two political points minus two momentum, so zero points. But when Versailles has minus two political and one momentum, so they're minus three. The zero that a Commune player has is higher than minus three, so Commune maintains initiative. If this is the round of card play after the third round, or after a round in which both of the players have then breached their final crisis space on their crisis track, then move on to the final crisis round. Players will take their saved cards from the previous rounds along with their final crisis card if they haven't played it already. Look at those cards and discard down to the number of rounds that have been played. If it was three rounds, three cards. If it was only two, then two cards. No objective cards are dealt, just proceed directly to card play, this time using only the events on the cards. So hopefully you've saved just your own faction's events cards or neutral cards, because otherwise the other player will get to trigger that event. Like in regular play, you'll alternate back and forth until the final card has been played by the last player. Once again, each player will be able to take their final pivotal space action, and then finally the last round of scoring military and political points. And now it's time to add up the final scores. As mentioned off the top, Commune needs to score more political points than Versailles has military to win and vice versa. So look at the score track, add any bonus points from either player's momentum track, and if the scores are tied, the tiebreakers are as follows. Most objective cards fulfilled, most pivotal spaces controlled at the end of the game, and then finally, the final initiative player. And if there's still any ties after that, the commune player wins. It's a zero-sum game here. Only winners and losers. No truces here in the City of Lights. So that is how you play Red Flag over Paris. You deal your four strategy cards to each player, deal two objective cards to each player, and they're going to select one for that round. Play the cards to add your own cubes, remove your opponents, increase your momentum, or take advantage of the events on the card. After the three cards each, execute those pivotal space actions, then you score your dimension points, Reveal and score your objective card points and you execute those events if you're successful. 
determine an initiative, rinse, repeat until you reach the final crisis. Then in final crisis, using your remaining cards events to lock in your last points. Count up the points and determine the winner. Red flag over Paris, it's a tight game of building your own progress while thwarting your opponents. It's a real seesaw battle and a lock and hop and in just three player turns over as many as four rounds. As abstract as this game may seem, it does give a strong sense of the resistance that the commune put up against the Versailles government. And it brings to life historical figures that I personally had never heard of before, including this woman, Louise Michel, who I would like to feature in a little segment that I'm calling This Piece Changes History. Louise Michel is one of the most iconic members of the Paris Commune. To this day, she is still considered as a symbol by anarchists and radical feminists. Born from an illegitimate union, she grew up in northeastern France and received a proper education from the parents of her biological father, members of the local petite bourgeoisie. After getting her school teacher diploma, she refused to take the imperial oath and moved to Paris in the 18th arrondissement to open her own school. As a convinced anarchist, she was focused on providing education to working class children and used innovative forms of teaching close to what today is known as active learning. In the 1860s, she became involved with the radical socialism that was brewing at the time in Paris, associating with figures such as Blanqui, Valet, Valin, and Ferret. She gained popularity during the siege of 1870 as she organized a school dining hall for the poor kids of her neighborhood. Thanks to the support of the local population of the 18th arrondissement, she got elected to the Vigilance Committee, a Parisian Republican organization created after the fall of the Second Empire. When on the 18th of March, the soldiers sent by Versailles came to Montmartre, she mobilized the population to confront the soldiers and made sure that the commune kept control of its cannons. First as a cantonier, and then as a soldier, Louise Michel took an active part in combat. She took part in all the major commune military operations, fighting in Niolet, Clamart, and Issay. She remained on the barricades until the last days of the bloody week. Michelle was among many women that were remembered for contributing to the Paris Commune. And if you look up women of the Paris Commune, her name is probably the first one you're going to find. Her power and influence is depicted well in her card. Uh, so not only does she increase revolutionary momentum, but then you can also use operation points in either public opinion or Paris spaces. So it really illustrates how important and versatile she was for the cause. And you got to love that flavor text too. Our greatest mistake was not planting the stake in the heart of the vampire, finance. Wow, really strong communist revolutionary anarchist vibes there, so you really get a good sense of, of what she stood for in that sentence. So that tidbit of history comes directly from the playbook, where there's historical information about every strategy card. And if you're interested in reading more, designer Fred shares a brief bibliography. He shared it online, and there's more in this book. Um, he's got some books he'd like to recommend, including Civil War in France by Karl Marx and Massacre by John Merriman. So I hope you get a chance to play this game and enjoy it as much as I do. It's such a quick game, and it's not hard to get two or three games in one setting, either with another player or in the solo mode. I highly recommend it. And I hope this video was helpful for you. I plan on doing more in the future, so please subscribe, stay tuned. Until then, happy gaming, and I hope to see you at the table one day. Cheers.